Today, we present the next session in this series titled Minimizing the Impact of a Pandemic, Smart Operations Management. I am Christine Thompson, the Executive Director of Executive Education at the Smith School of Business, and we are working in partnership with Smith's Office of Alumni Relations to power this series. We would especially like to welcome our Smith and University of Maryland alumni and current students who have joined us today from across the world. We appreciate your time and hope you find this a valuable source of learning. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Anand Anandlingam. Professor Anandlingam is the Ralph J. Tizer Professor of Management of Science at the Robert H. Smith School of Business at the University of Maryland. He was Dean of Imperial College of Business School at Imperial College London from August 2013 to July 2016. Previous to that, he was the Dean of the Smith School of Business at Maryland from 2007 to 2013. Before joining Smith in 2001, Anand was at the University of Pennsylvania for nearly 15 years, where he was both a professor in engineering and at the Wharton School of Business. Anand received numerous academic and teaching awards while at the Smith School, as well as a variety of scholarships, fellowships, prizes, and endowed endowed appointments at Pennsylvania, Harvard, and Cambridge. He was published more than 100 papers in four books and has presented his work in numerous prestigious international conferences. His research has evolved from economic dynamics and policy to energy and environmental systems analysis to design and pricing of telecommunications and information systems to technology strategy to leadership and social entrepreneurship. Anna received his PhD from Harvard University and his BA from Cambridge University. I want to personally thank Anand for his support of this important webinar series. Before Anand begins, one last thing, I want to ask everyone to please keep your microphones on mute to reduce the background, background noise. Anand will be presenting his material for approximately 25 minutes and then we'll move into a 15 or 20 minute question and answer period. And we will post your questions in the chat area and we will address them thematically during the question and answer time. And I'll remind you via chats uh, occasionally during this time. I'm going to turn it over to Anand. Anand, thank you again. Hey, thank you, Chris. And um, uh, thank you for all of you who have joined me this morning. Um, I, um, uh, it's a pleasure for me to talk to you. And uh, I hope I'm coming through loud, loud and clear. Um, so um, this uh, talk, uh, as you can see, is about uh, uh, using smart operations management to minimize the impact of a pandemic. I should start by uh, uh, a couple of uh, disclaimers. So one disclaimer is that, uh, obviously I'm not going to tell you about how to solve the current problem because uh, we are in a real crisis mode and um, you know the authorities uh, in all over the world are trying to do the best they can with the crisis. But um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, you know, some of the issues uh, if only smart uh, operations management was uh, used that uh, how we could have kind of dealt with it a little bit better and uh, perhaps uh, it's a lesson for the future so it's more of a lesson for the future than really what's going on right now uh, the second uh, uh, thing uh, is that uh, I, I have hay fever so if I sneeze don't panic I'm, I'm okay all right okay so the first thing is uh, what is the real crisis right now and the crisis right now is really a nexus between uh, the public health crisis in the form of this novel coronavirus that uh, you know, is creating the, uh, this disease called COVID-19 and also uh, inadequate management of operations. Um, because uh, the, the fact of the matter is that uh, the reason for flattening the curve is because the resources in the United States, in the hospital systems, the healthcare systems, um, are not adequate to deal with a huge spike in uh, uh, illnesses or in, in certainly in serious illnesses. So, um, you know, if we, we kind of uh, reduce the spike, and, and that's true not only for the United States, but also for most of the countries in the rest of the world. If we reduce the spike, then uh, we are really not uh, uh, kind of putting great demands on the healthcare system, and then the healthcare system would have been able to cope with it much better. So that's well understood. Uh, it's not as though uh, we are going to uh, uh, get rid of the disease by flattening the curve, it's just that we are managing how the disease progresses through the economy, through the country. And so really you're trying to deal with this demand supply gap. 
not enough supply of medical uh, equipment, uh, doctors, whole bunch of things. So what are the uh, supply issues? Well, not enough hospital beds, right? For pr uh, those presenting with strong symptoms, not enough ventilators and intubators for those with re serious respiratory problems. Certainly not enough masks and PPE. So at the beginning of this crisis, there, you know, uh, my daughter is a doctor in New York and she had to go to work uh, without uh, proper protective equipment because there was not enough PPEs uh, for the healthcare providers. And so in order to deal with this uh, supply issues, the uh, policy in almost every country was to try to reduce the demand, reduce the spike by uh, minimizing uh, you know, the number of people uh, who uh, could have been, uh, uh, you know, could have actually got the disease, got sick, got seriously sick and so on. And also by staying at home and also social dis distancing, what you're really doing is reducing the demand for the uh, issues, you know, the supply issues that we're dealing with. Uh, now, uh, as we move forward, uh, one of the big issues is about testing. Um, for both the uh, virus and for antibodies and for contact tracing to make sure that if anybody actually has the virus that, you know, to see who, how many other people they have actually come into contact with. Uh, again, you know, the, uh, the way to deal with the fact that we don't have enough resources to do all these things is to actually reduce the spike and in other words, stay at home. Uh, and so really what we're doing now is uh, managing the demand supply issue by these uh, very drastic policies. And you can see they're very drastic because in uh, lots of parts of the United States, uh, people are getting really, really angry about staying at home for two months, more than two months. And uh, you know, it, it's become very difficult for some of them and also to, to simply socially distance and stay at home. But on top of that, we are really put our economy uh, and also the economies of many different countries into a dire strait by, by not having enough economic activity. So reducing the demand is very, very important, but also it comes with a huge cost, okay? So um, uh, what, what is uh, smart operations management? What does that mean? Well, one of the things that we do is really spend a lot of time on managing the demand supply gap. Uh, it's not that it's always that uh, supply is not enough to meet demand. Fr frequently, the demand is not enough to meet supply. I mean, we are, the economy, for example, right now, there's not enough people, uh, not enough demand, not enough people uh, really buying things, um, you know, and so you're going to see, I mean, certainly the airlines is one good example where, um, you know, nobody's flying, right? Uh, very few people are flying. And so not enough demand, uh, there's a lot of supply. And so that turns out that it's gonna be a big losses for many different companies. Some of those companies may never uh, recover from this uh, lack of demand. And so we are probably going to see bankruptcy. So in, a, in normal times, you're not only dealing with uh, the fact that there is not enough supply to deal with demand, you're dealing with uh, frequently not enough demand. And so we do a lot of things in order to boost up demand, including marketing, including public relations, social media, we do a lot of things to make sure that there's actually demand uh, because there's enough supply to go around. In this particular case, the problem is there is not enough supply to deal with demand. So how do we deal with these things? Well, first thing we need to do is look at the problem as a system. I mean, wh what are the goals and objectives that we are trying to optimize? So, uh, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about why we are in this position, because sometimes you try to optimize cost uh, and try to minimize cost, and that leads to certain consequences. Uh, if you're trying to uh, 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 minimize time, uh, time for serving customers, time for dealing with these crises, uh, time for um, uh, getting drugs approved, uh, that um, is going to be an issue as well. That could be one of the things that we're trying to minimize as, you know, in the system. And of course, uh, cons custom satisfaction becomes a big part of what uh, lots of systems are trying to deal with uh, or, or optimize. Uh, so in order to understand that, if you're doing smart operations, you will first start by trying to figure out what are the bottlenecks in the system. 
And I'll give you a bunch of examples of all this. What are the bottlenecks? What is preventing us from speeding things up? What is preventing us from optimizing cost? What is preventing us from customer satisfaction? So what are the bottlenecks and how do we reduce or eliminate bottlenecks? So one of the things that we teach in our programs, especially when you do operations management, is to understand how to map the entire system, how to do some process analysis of the entire system, and then figure out you know, where are the bottlenecks, where are the pain points, and how can we really fix the pain points? I'll give you an example uh, of uh, uh, the N95 mask. I mean, I'm sure a lot of you have heard about the fact that in the beginning, there was not enough N95 masks. And uh, you know, uh, the, all the doctors uh, were in panic uh, and uh, they were reusing N95 masks. Uh, the, these masks are supposed to be only used once uh, because you know, they are designed to fit uh, a particular doctor and also uh, you know, uh, there could well be germs on those masks and so on. So what uh, the United States did or does that as a practice is that um, uh, essentially, uh, you know, uh, uh, sorry, um, uh, 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 does bulk ordering of these masks and is bulk ordered by an organization called the Group Purchasing Organizations. And uh, they are the ones who supply almost every hospital in the US, thousands of hospitals in the US. And, in our, and the reason for bulk ordering is because then they can negotiate the best prices. And it turns out the best prices are from China. So the, it's mass produced in China at about 50 cents a mass. Now, when the H1N1 crisis hit, right, they suddenly realized that it was, uh, they needed a lot more masks than uh, they had thought in, uh, you know, in the hospitals. And so uh, the uh, 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 administration at the time uh, pushed to start manufacturing domestically. And uh, so when you start manufacturing domestically, you can speed up the production, you can bring it into a uh, Use very quickly and so on. So a bunch of people um, and Mike Bowen is one of those entrepreneurs uh, started a company called Prestige Ameritech, and you will you will would have seen him in 60 Minutes, and he has come on television very recently. Um, he quit his job. Uh, he uh, basically bought a facility that is owned by Kimberly Clark and started producing these masks. Of course, they were more expensive than 50 cents per mask. Um, but um, once the crisis and, and, and he hired 150 people or something like that and, and you know, started producing these masks, once the crisis abated, uh, the system then went back to uh, the hospital system and back to the old way of doing things. So they basically started, uh, didn't uh, buy it from Mike Bourne and started buying it back from China. And of course, the company. Uh, went into bankruptcy. Uh, he tried very hard to explain to people that you needed a stockpile of masks in the United States. And, uh, you know, it went through all sorts of steps of, uh, you know, procurement and so on, and nothing happened. So, so he uh, essentially uh, was in bad shape. Uh, he is, he's in the news now because uh, he's, uh, you know, clearly we made a mistake at that point. When the COVID-19 hit, of course, uh, China uh, basically uh, uh, went into lockdown and uh, none of the factories in China could really operate and whatever masks that were there, they were used it, used it for domestic purposes right away. So, uh, of course, we had something called a, na a strategic national stockpile, which had about 13 million masks. And, and you might say, okay, 13 million is a lot big number, but turns out that it would have only lasted about three weeks uh, one mask per person per day, which is the protocol, if only New York and California uh, was going to be supplied. So that, that uh, really uh, uh, became a big problem. And so there was a huge crisis in the beginning of this pandemic because there was not enough masks, simple thing like a mask. And so now, of course, uh, we've kind of gone into a situation where uh, we are ordering many more masks, 600 million 
masks uh, you know, are, are going to be purchased by the uh, United States uh, for their national uh, strategic national stockpile. And uh, of course, you know, we also got into this competition. Uh, different states started competing for masks. Uh, different states started buying things directly from places like China and uh, Thailand and so on and so forth. And there was confusion and, and short supply. So all of this could have been avoided if we had a good sense as to what our supply chain was. So uh, there are two kinds of supply chains. There is an efficient supply chain and the efficient supply chain basically tries to squeeze out as much cost as possible from the supply chain. You have master negotiators, you have bulk buyers who can negotiate at every step and really uh, push costs down as much as possible. Uh, you try to have just-in-time inventory uh, and, uh, you know, uh, companies like Walmart have done a really good job in really minimizing the cost of the goods and, uh, that they sell, right? So that's an efficient supply chain. And that's what the hospital system did in the United States. Another one is something called a responsive supply chain. And we know what that is. And we, we know lots of companies use that. Uh, you respond very quickly to changing customer demand. So one outcome is that you have distributed inventory. You don't have inventory all in one place and uh, you, know, you have it in various places. Zara is a famous example. They, they are the ones who are really into this thing called fast fashion. They change their inventory of, uh, of goods every two, three weeks. So in order to make sure that they up, keep upgrading and changing the clothes they sell, they have to have a very responsive supply chain. I'm sure many of you are watching Netflix uh, and, uh, and uh, so how Netflix works is the same way. The only way they can actually stream things to you almost instantaneously is to store their uh, movies and their uh, series and so on in various parts of, of, the, of the United States. So they, they will have some of their stuff uh, stored in their own uh, uh, you know, storage systems at the Netflix uh, uh, facilities, but they also have you know, things stored uh, in uh, their nearest internet service provider and so on and so forth. So they have a very sophisticated way of ensuring that when you ask for something that you can get it almost instantaneously, right? So we know how to uh, work with responsive supply chains. And so you really need to have a responsive supply chain to deal with these kinds of crises. So moving forward, uh, it is very important that uh, the uh, you know, national, uh, strategic national stockpile of health equipment uh, uh, needs to use the concepts from uh, smart operations management, in particular, uh, set up a, a very responsive supply chain and uh, yeah, you know, uh, uh, find ways in which they can distribute uh, Resources, it's not just about masks, it's also about uh, uh, personal protective equipment, it's also about uh, other things that uh, are now in short supply around the country because of the fact that we've been doing something very different. Okay, you can also uh, uh, man uh, distribute manufacturing both domestically and globally and find a way to kind of have a portfolio of, of stuff that can work much faster when you need it, right? Um, now, what happens when you actually have a crisis? So this is an example from Toyota. Um, you know, it, I mean, it's very nice to say we need to set up a responsive supply chain, which is what we should do for the future. But what do you do during a crisis? So uh, Toyota had to deal with a huge crisis in 1997 because there was a factory fire that wiped out um, the entire production from a company called Isin CK, um, and uh, they were suppliers of something small called the P valve uh, that essentially, uh, uh, you know, modulated uh, the brake when you brake versus how it ended up in your on your tires. But um, uh, Toyota uh, produced all their P valves from this company, and when there was a factory fire completely wiped out everything. So uh, the production of Toyota vehicles um, came to a complete halt, okay? So how did uh, Toyota respond? Well, first of all, note the time. I mean, the fire started at 4.18 a.m. 
on February 1st. By 6.30 a.m. on the same day, they got together and tried to figure out where can they produce these P valves outside of this company? Where else can they produce it? And they had a plan set in motion within a day. And within one month, Toyota completely rebounded. They were back to normal production. One month, this is unbelievable. Um, they lost about 70,000 vehicles uh, in that one month, but then Toyota makes and uh, sells uh, millions of orders per year. So, so how did they do that? Well, number one is that uh, they got on a war footing, right? They said, okay, this is like a, you know, a complete crisis. It's like the tsunami. Uh, we cannot uh, uh, you know, kind of stand on reason. We need to really move our operations very quickly. Uh, they gave up a bunch of sacred cows. Uh, they sent detailed instructions for making the P valve to everybody. Um, so they gave up the IP protection of the P valve. They also decided to give up something called the Keretsu, which is the relationship you have with all the um, uh, suppliers. They said, we don't need to just stick to our current suppliers. Uh, we can uh, you know, go with all sorts of new suppliers. And they gave up their just-in-time uh, uh, inventory system that they had uh, perfected up to that point. Uh, they also got companies like uh, uh, Brother Industries that used to produce sewing machines to start producing P-valves. Okay? So it, it's a very quick response to get the entire production system moving much faster. So what is the lessons to be learned here? Well, the war analogy holds when you are in a crisis. And um, uh, so what uh, the administration has done, uh, uh, kind of eventually, they took them some time to invoke the Defense Production Act. Um, what they have not done is to invoke the national pride, saying that this is an important thing for our country and everybody comes together to do things. Instead, uh, there has been arguments with different companies about what to do and what not to do, especially in terms of producing ventilators. Um, uh, we did a really good job in the first Iraq war, where we mobilized the defense logistics organization that could that very quickly got the entire logistics of the war operations in place. Uh, should have done that, right? And so there are people uh, in uh, the U.S. government who are, who are well versed in how to how to create very quickly a very responsive operation, right? And you need to make your operations open and flexible streamline internal systems, be innovative about who the suppliers and vendors are, be very flexible and, and speedy in terms of uh, how the resources flow from production to use. Um, you have to minimize uh, confusion about who manufactures and who supplies and things like that, and so on. So you really need to kind of get into a war footing when you're dealing, when you're creating this responsive supply chain during a pandemic, okay? Um, Inventory is a problem in the U.S. healthcare system. Hopefully, there's lessons to be learned uh, and that uh, moving into the future, that we will uh, be a little bit more smart about how you manage inventory. They, uh, uh, the crisis has shown that uh, there are problems with, uh, you know, masks and PPEs and, uh, you know, all sorts of things like that. But turns out that we are in short supply in something like, uh, oxygen, because, uh, uh, you know, we, we've got into this uh, just-in-time uh, view of, in the healthcare. Uh, we are short in terms of things like sterile saline solutions, which are basic IV uh, uh, fluid that uh, people use. And in fact, uh, we've done the same thing that Toyota did, had have one company in Puerto Rico that produces most of the saline solutions that uh, end up in hospitals in the U.S. So I think the entire healthcare system needs to look at their inventory management in a much different way and uh, you know, come up with uh, uh, ideas from smart operations, um, continuous monitoring and early detection of supply chain issues and deal with resilience versus cost. So one of the things, uh, me messages uh, I want to uh, get across in this webinar is that resiliency is as important as cost. Um, you should understand uh, what is the, and this is true for the healthcare system, but it's also true for companies in general. Uh, how long can your company endure 
when there's a sudden shortage of a critical good, right, like in Toyota, how, what is the time to survive? What is the time to recover? How much time will it take to restore adequate supplies of some critical good? And then uh, if you're doing smart operations, you will ensure that the time to survive is greater than the time to recover. In other words, you can survive until you put into place things that will help you recover, okay? Uh, and there are some examples uh, what Toyota did, I mean, what South Korea did with the medical equipment suppliers is unbelievable because they have an entire registry of uh, medical equipment suppliers and testing labs, and they have the inventory levels. And so when the crisis hit South Korea, they were able to move really, really, really quickly. Okay, um, moving right along, I'm sure everybody is wondering, you know, how do you open the economy now? Okay, I mean, uh, is there anything that you can do in terms of opening the economy? I mean, there are really three uh, different things one can do. I know that everybody is waiting for a vaccine, but the vaccine is going to take a long time. And, uh, you know, uh, my take, in my opinion, and my, uh, I would say, educated opinion, because I've been looking at it very closely, um, it may, there may not be a vaccine for mass use for at least another year. So how do you open the economy? Well, the most difficult thing is to try to contain the virus through a, a system of testing, contact tracing, isolating, and so on. And uh, uh, that's a huge effort. And so if you, uh, 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 in order to kind of follow that effort, you really have to build a operations infrastructure that can actually make sure that you monitor all the cases of the virus, identify hotspots, ensure the system runs efficiently, and making sure that you can provide adequate PPEs for everyone who needs it. Um, you have to probably deploy uh, border controls to vet people entering the country, not just from Mexico, but from all sorts, all parts of the world, and so on. That's the most difficult thing to do. A simpler thing to do, which is being practiced in places like Austria and Germany, is to uh, say, look, we are going to open up parts of the, and, and we are, it seems like we are doing the same thing, uh, open up parts of the, uh, of the economy and keep track of what's going on. And so you might have to uh, kind of, if things get worse, go back to a lockdown and so on. So it'll be an intelligent timing of lockdown and release, lockdown and release. And so that uh, makes the economy unstable but uh, that's another way of doing things. So the easiest thing to do is to do nothing, uh, which uh, 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 Sweden has done. But uh, what Sweden has done is they do have uh, rules about people over 70 uh, and, and also people with uh, uh, health conditions and so on. But the main point from my, uh, this webinar is that you need an operation strategy for each. So what about operation strategy for the first option? That's the only thing I'm going to talk about. Uh, you obviously need tests that can detect uh, COVID-19, okay? So the process modeling of this testing is not simply testing. If you need to really have probes, you need to find a way to amplify the sample. You need the uh, chemical, uh, you know, um, uh, reactors to tell you whether there is a COVID-19 virus or not. And so you need a whole bunch of resources. Turns out, that uh, when we started testing, that something as simple as the probes was the bottleneck. So, you know, the, people didn't understand that. And so rather than uh, really talking about, well, we need more chemical reagents and we need more CDC approvals and blah, blah, blah. I think you know, they should, if they had really done a, a good analysis, they would have figured out the biggest bottleneck was actually the probes, right? Not really the chemical reagents. So it's important to uh, kind of really look at the entire system and figure out where are the bottlenecks, okay? Uh, the other thing is the quality. So one of the things that we do in operations is to talk about, you know, how do you deal with quality issues? And there are some issues about false positive versus false negative for both testing for COVID-19 and for antibody testing. And um, so if you have a false positive in the COVID-19 testing, uh, you might think you have a disease when you don't, and, uh, and that might uh, uh, put excess demand on the healthcare system. If you have a false negative, um, then you, somebody who has a disease might not come, the test may not show that, and then you might have a potential for uh, more people getting infected. 
And so you really need to follow it up with contact tracing, all right? Um, a similar kind of thing with antibody testing, right? So speed is of essence for testing. And uh, in, uh, uh, we were slow here because uh, we have our own uh, system of uh, how to uh, prove tests and those kinds of things. So if you look at the history, I mean, China reported the DNA of the virus in mid-January and countries like Thailand and South Korea very, very quickly started building test kits. The WHO also started building test kits, but we rejected those test kits because we wanted uh, to do it ourselves. And um, so uh, there was a huge bottleneck in approving test kits. So it's not simply bottleneck, it's not simply connected to equipment, it's also connected to some uh, decision-making processes, right? So, um, you know, uh, uh, the FDA also took a long time uh, to uh, approve some of these tests, but now, luckily, uh, after a lot of pressure, they have come up with something called the Coronavirus Treatment Acceleration Program. Uh, testing time speed is a big bottleneck for the US healthcare system. Uh, we have had this problem uh, during the AIDS crisis in the 80s and the 90s. Um, you, even today, uh, for the doctors to approve medical use of medical oxygen at home, uh, it, it, there are like 10 different approval steps and many of them are disconnected and so on. So if you're really doing smart operations, uh, you really uh, um, deal with the quality versus speed dilemma. Streamline the processes, use technologies, learn from global experts. And there's somebody, you know, somebody said, well, why, don't, why do the American doctors, why are they so resistant to learning from Chinese doctors, in, especially in this crisis where we've been in the front line for much longer? All right, um, contact tracing, um, and I'm gonna stop with this as uh, one of my last slides. Um, again, it involves uh, actually having a network of contact tracers, and you can do that with technology, which is what China is doing, or you can do it with people, which is what India is doing, and uh, uh, you know, find a way to make sure that this entire operation of contact tracing is managed uh, with the right information and the right sort of leadership, right? So in a, a state like Kerala in India, uh, the health minister there is this woman called, called Sileja, and she, the, it, as soon as they heard about the crisis in India, I mean in China, they set up an entire army of people to do testing and contact tracing. And uh, they had very strict rules about quarantining if you actually had the disease and so on. And so they've managed to contain it with hardly anybody dying. Amazing. Okay. All right. So I will uh, skip that slide and uh, let me get, finish with the final thought. Um, I talk about resilience, um, the two quotes, efficiency as, at the cost of resilience is like a silent, silent aneurysm waiting to rupture. This is by a doctor, Siddharth Mukherjee, who's pretty well known. Um, uh, and then, of course, uh, Warren Buffett uh, says, well, when the tide goes out, you discover who has been swimming naked. With that, I'll stop and uh, open it up for questions. Thank you, Anand. Um, very insightful and uh, kind of a few um, wish and could haves and should haves and all that thrown in the mix, right? <laughs> Thank you. Um, let me start with uh, one question here. Um, how does one decide how many, how much inventory of medical medical supplies one needs. How does that planning happen? And, and do you have any insights on making that smarter? Uh, yeah, so in, in this particular, so if I'm gonna just stick to this uh, health crisis, um, I, I think obviously you have to start uh, in, a, in a normal operation, if you're in a company, what you would do is you would start forecasting demand and trying to figure out how do, uh, you know, uh, what are the peak demands and what are the uh, you know, shallow demands and and then um, come up with a, uh, a method for dealing with, you can say, we'll, we'll deal with 90% of the peak demand. Uh, to give you an example, when uh, uh, a long time ago, when AT&T uh, designed the telecommunication network right around the United States, I'm talking about the 1950s and 60s, um, they found out that the peak demand was actually on Mother's Day, 
So Mother's Day, everybody called their mother. And so the huge demand on the telephone system. And so they designed their network to deal with that peak demand. So during other times, there was excess, excess capacity, but they wanted to make sure that there was capacity to deal with that peak demand. Um, so in the case of the health crisis, the, one of the things that is surprising is that this is this pandemics don't happen all the time, right? It's once every hundred years kind of thing. So people tend to not really uh, uh, think that they need to really have inventory to deal with this pandemics. But what we are finding out now is it's, this is no longer a black sock swan event. We are, seem to be getting these kinds of pandemics or crises every several years. So the first thing to do is to have a sense as to how to forecast and how much do you think is go going to be a demand on the, on the system, on the healthcare system, when the next one happens. And then that will give you insights into how much excess inventory do you need to have. You also need to figure out how to refresh your inventory, right? Something like an N95 mask doesn't spoil, uh, but oxygen supplies do spoil. So you need to figure that one out as well. So first you start to start with trying to forecast the demand. Very good, thank you. We have a question that's somewhat related to that and maybe we can get your perspectives for a minute about how the supply chain and the globalization of the supply chain is it going to be affected as you look forward, given some of the examples you provided about countries and states making equipment themselves kind of in an isolated self system, right? A single system within a country and so forth. So question really around globalization and the effect on the supply chain. Yeah, I think um, uh, th there are kind of uh, two uh, con con conflicting lessons uh, that people are learning from this. Uh, one uh, lesson is that uh, these pandemics are global and um, uh, we really uh, need to have a global approach uh, to dealing with these pandemics. So you need a global supply chain. Uh, in fact, if you look at what's going on right now, um, uh, we do, we are still getting uh, stuff in the United States uh, from countries like South Korea and China and so on. And I know that uh, President Trump has said that we, uh, because we now have excess ventilators, we're actually sending ventilators to other countries. So there is some sharing going on. And so the supply chain may continue to be a little bit global, right? On the other hand, uh, there is a, uh, the other school of thought says, well, you know, we have to hunker down and take care of our own people. So let's build everything here because that way when the crisis actually hits, we can be much more responsive, right? So uh, maybe the global supply chain, especially dealing with the crisis like this uh, may not be necessary. We can do everything domestically. I think there has to be a, co a combination of both because, um, you, you know, you cannot, uh, say that the cost is not important at all and you cannot say uh, you know resilience is the only important thing so um, I, I think there will be a uh, distribution I'll give an example from BMW very interesting example if you go and buy a BMW um, frequently uh, they will tell you your car is actually uh, on the ship between Hamburg and New York right? And we will get you the car. So they, what they do is they have a distributed supply chain where the inventory is in various places. It may be in the factory in Hamburg, maybe in a sh ship uh, uh, on the way to the US. It may be in the port in New York, and it could be in your dealership in Baltimore, right? So uh, I think what the, the best outcome might be some kind of distributed supply chain where countries cooperate. And if the hotspot is in the US, we deal with the US. If the hotspot is in uh, Sweden, then we deal with Sweden, and if the hotspot is in uh, India, let's say, we deal with India, and that, that would be, if I were to design it, <laughs> that would be how I would design it. <laughs> Perhaps we need you to design it then. <laughs> um, I'm going to move to another question. We may only have time for this last one. We'll see here. Um, regarding the FDA, can the FDA really speed up the approval of drugs and procedures without increasing safety issues? What are your thoughts around that? Uh, yeah, so that is a very good question because, um, you know, there's always this uh, concern uh, and, and uh, uh, some of my, even my medical friends have said this to me that if they speed up the production of a vaccine, that they would be very nervous because they're not sure how safe the vaccine is going to be, right? So, um, so you have to be careful that you don't speed things up uh, uh, and take shortcuts and, and really uh, mess up the uh, kind of safety of 
the drugs or the vaccines and so on and so forth. Uh, on the other hand, uh, one, I have done some consulting work in this area and um, uh, lots and lots, and I'm sure people who are listening in might agree with me, there are lots of approval processes uh, at the state and federal level that are cumbersome and uh, legacy based. So they, they keep all the legacy pro processes in place in spite of the fact that we are in the 21st century with uh, you know, technology. So I think if you, uh, uh, what I would do is I would look at all these approval processes and find out where can we squeeze out uh, inefficiencies because there are lots of inefficiencies so you can still maintain safety and speed things up so one of the consulting projects I did many years ago is uh, to approve drugs it used, it used to take 10 15 10 12 years actually because there were lots and lots of things that FDA wanted you to do that could have been done in parallel rather than sequentially so if you simply parallelize the process we could have we saved like four years of the of the approval process. So I think, yeah, safety is very important. Now, the final thought is maybe a little controversial. I would say that uh, when a tsunami hits, you can't, uh, you know, simply be worrying a, a lot about only safety, right? I mean, uh, the Titanic, for example, it was heading towards uh, uh, so, some weird thing, but the captain was asleep and the protocol said, do not wake the captain up until a particular time uh, until a particular thing and so the, they lost a couple of hours just because they followed old procedures so when you're looking at a tsunami perhaps uh, you know you need to make some trade-offs as well thank you those are those are wise words to to end the conversation today um we appreciate that do you mind advancing the slide real quick um, yeah yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Anand. This has been a um, really important conversation, and I, I dare say we probably need to follow up as we follow the um, crisis and are living the crisis and, and are learning more as we go along. So thank you again. I um, really appreciate it. Thank you for everyone for joining us. The webinar you've attended here has been recorded and will include the slides. We'll, we will let attendees know when the recording is available so that you can review and share with colleagues and friends. We look forward to presenting our next webinar in this series, as you can see here, Remote Work and Emotional Intelligence, Tackling Difficult Conversations with our own Dr. Nicole Coomer on the 27th of May. Please keep check checking back with us for more webinars and short courses and other learning opportunities from the Smith School of Business and Executive Education. We thank you very much from both the Executive Education and Alumni Relations team. Teams, we are happy to support you in your lifelong learning. Please stay safe, be well, and as always, go Terps. Thank you, Anand, once again for your time today. Thank you. And thank, thank you, you for everybody who has been listening in. Appreciate it. Thank you.